Hello Vinyl Community, Alice Picard here with another little report about music selected and music heard. This time I thought let's have a little bit of fun. Because uh, let's, talk about, let's talk about progressive rock and uh, some famous failures or so-called failures of progressive rock which uh, still can be found reflected on the YouTube where People still create videos just to slug them off and to destroy them <laughs> and to spoil all the hate over certain albums that were regarded as a betrayal of the progressive integrity. So I thought I'd, I'd pick and select some of those which get mentioned a lot and just uh, give it a listen with fresh ears and just report about uh, yeah, well, this kind of experience. So. Um, Let's start. Now, um, let's start with the with the one prog band that uh, seems to have uh, all, <laughs> all the patents on uh, disappointment, which is of course Genesis, and um, their album Abacup. Now, as far as the Genesis story is known to me. Um, the first uh, big change happened when Peter Gabriel left the band and and you will still find a lot of people that uh, believe that uh, this was the end of the good Genesis and everything that came later was quite horrific, which is not true. But actually, um, since uh, the remaining musicians uh, kept uh, true to a certain progressive formula for quite a while, um, all the albums that followed, some of the albums that followed, um, have been appreciated for a, for a progressive sensibility. Now, Abba Cup was the first album where the remaining trio of Genesis sort of wanted to arrive in the, in the uh, post-punk uh, MTV pop world of the 80s. And... Uh, that's how they did it. So I haven't heard this album for quite a while. It's a nice sleeve picture here. Rutherford, Banks and Collins. So yeah, I gave it a listen. Um, and uh, of course I uh, made the effort to look into some of the review videos surrounding these albums that I have here and uh, just to confirm <laughs> all the vitriol, <laughs> and uh, this is not a popular album in the in the progressive rock community, and I must say there is all kind of tracks on it that I really did not like, but it's not all that bad. Um, first of all, I really like the first song, Abba Cup is a great track. It's very dynamic. It's very funny. It sounds good. Um, I think the highlight the highlight of this album is on the B side. Two tracks called Dodo and Lurker. I know there's stuff like Who Done It on it, which is by many regarded the worst Genesis song of all times. Um, but come on, it's it's a it's a novelty bullshit song, and um, this should be taken with a little bit humor. So is it a bad album? No, it's not a bad album. It's it's not a great album, but it's true that some of these songs left not much of an impression on me. But it's not a bad album. Now let's go to 1983. This is when Ian Anderson and Jethro Tull decided to go full electronic. Now this happened, uh, this was expressed in two albums. First of all his first solo album, Walk Into Light. And a year later, Under Wraps, 1984. Now uh, in both cases this was uh, heavily uh, influenced by the presence of a new keyboard player, the much younger than the rest, uh, Peter John Vettessi from Scotland. And uh, so he was this young uh, geek that enabled uh, the rest of the band to enter this world of, uh, of uh, big uh, synthesizer manuals and, um, and, and sampling and electronics and, and all this things that uh, Ian Anderson tried to avoid after that up until today. Now these two albums I did not 
need to have an extra listen or to analyze them in any way because I know them by heart because regardless of the fact that uh, those are probably the most hated albums by 90% of all Jethro Tull fans those are two of my favorite albums at all now imagine that now this can only mean that a bunch of uh, sort of a Tull fan majority is wrong or that I'm crazy. Now this is of course your choice to decide that but I really appreciate both of these albums. Actually I made in German I just made a, 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 a review video of them just two days ago. Now I could go into all kind of details about why I think that those are brilliant excellent and wonderful recordings and um, powerful statements and uh, intriguing music a uh, lot of uh, strange humor and wonderful lyrics but if you are open-minded and you, have, you give it a listen you will be surprised because of course both albums sounds nothing like Jethro Tull or the Jethro Tull most people know they are completely different they are, they are synthesizer music with uh, a lot of heavy rhythms and uh, a lot of sampling and uh, and all kind of craziness. Wonderful. <laughs> so so stop shitting over these albums because they are part of my favorite music. Now this is um, hmm this is an interesting album. Let's talk about Mr. Rick Wakeman. Now Rick Wakeman made all of his prog rock albums for A and and after leaving A and he started to explore different uh, kind of uh, music and that's how the album Rock and Roll Prophet came about. Now um, there is there are a couple of things that can be said about this album that come to my mind. This came out on Moon so check out this Moon label quite cool. Now um, if I'm not wrong this was 19 80 maybe when this was released let me have a look 1982 but uh, what I do know is that Wakeman recorded this album and I think he was I don't think he was not able to release it probably and um, I know that he put it on the shelf for like two years and then it came out um, which maybe was a mistake because if this came out two years earlier um, a certain well, musical revolutionary nature of this album would have been more imminent because this is a strange odd album but it's also very cool in a sense it's just not this is not um, this is not progressive music in a sense of how you perceive prog rock but um, this is more electronic experimental crazy pop music it's much closer to stuff like the Buggles for example and um, there are a lot of sounds on it. I mean, there's, there's a track called The Dragon, which is really like an anticipation of computer music, of computer gaming music of the 80s. Well, there's also something else that comes into mind. I mean, the cover is totally unacceptable, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> welcome to the early 80s. I mean, today you would get so much shit for this kind of a barely legal cover theme. Um, it's not the first time that Rick Wakeman covers um, were not exactly in good taste. Um, but, well, what can you do? Oh yeah, the next one I don't have on vinyl, I have it on CD. Of course, let's talk about the, the mother of all progressive rock soap operas which is of course yes and their album Union now this is the most hated album by the yes members themselves they all kind of disowned it and uh, Rick Wakeman keeps calling it Onion instead of Union because every time he sees or hears it he has to cry um, this was um, expected as this epic album idea where basically uh, a band that has fallen apart into two camps would get together and create an epic prog 
album with eight members, which is not exactly <laughs> what happened. But while everybody is shitting all over this album, um, I can get on board with a lot of tracks here. I think there's a lot of good music on it. And uh, I mean, those, those tracks that I do not appreciate that much come mostly from this sort of Trevor Rabin camp. There are some really horrendous pop songs on it. Yeah, I mean, tracks like Lift Me Up is really something I can do without. Now, I never bought this on vinyl for a reason, because here on the CD there are two tracks, Give and Take and Angkor Wat. Um, now, especially Angkor Wat, which by most people is regarded as sort of a novelty, nonsense, filler song, I actually pretty appreciate. It's a sort of a Rick Wakeman uh, um, meandering um, keyboard sound with the, with the... Um, Cambodian voice telling a story and John Anderson singing a little bit. It's very ambient like and uh, I always liked this song. Now Rick Wakeman will probably say that it's shit because uh, he can't recognize any, any of the music on it because it has been changed behind his back. But I have a theory that at this point of time this whole band was completely unproducible. At this time, half of the band was just willing to fight and to shout at each other, while the other half of the band was completely stoned. So somebody had to be reasonable in the studio, in a project that cost money and that already had a lot of people involved. So people started to kind of mend this whole thing, to, to tinker, to repair it, so in the end there will be something that resembles an album. I always thought it's a little bit dishonest by Yes to talk so bad about it, Regarding the fact that this is their band, so if this if this went off the rails in such a in such a manner, then it's of course mostly their own fault. Obviously, they did not manage to keep the reins together to steer clear of um, interference. So yeah, I'm pretty sure. I mean, there's like there's like. There are like 500 guest musicians on this and all kind of producers and everybody, everyone is doing something. But um, regarding the fact how much interference there was, the result is actually pretty nice. And um, I think if the, if the musicians of Yes cannot, I mean, especially, I mean, the loudest voices in this case are probably Bill Bruford and Rick Wakeman, who uh, I think they both kind of expressed that this is the worst album they ever played on. But uh, isn't that their fault? I mean, this is their name, <laughs> this is their band, so... Um, and at this, point of t oh, at this point in time, which is 1991, I think, yeah, they were old and mature enough to know how to control a band in a studio. So, um, it's, a, it's an interesting, complicated matter and a big milestone in a soap opera like uh, history of this strange band called yes and i like this cd not completely but i like like 40 percent 50 percent of it it's quite good and there are really good tracks on it like um the more we live by chris choir great song um take the water to the mountains well what, this was certainly a song meant for another anderson wakeman bruford and how album and so on there's a lot of good stuff on it i mean it's much better than a big generator, which is a joke, and it's much better than talk, which is a disgrace. Ah, okay, I'm, I'm not the type for slugging off albums. Other people do much better job um, by doing that on the internet. Never understood this uh, vitriol directed towards this album. So let's come to the final, final jewel at the end of the road. And by definition, the most hated album in progressive rock history, which of course is Love Beach by Emerson Lake and Palmer. Now, I have this on CD as well, which can only mean that I don't find it as horrible as the rest of the pro rock community. And why is that? Well, yeah, let's talk about Love Beach a little. <laughs> <laughs> is it a good album? It's certainly not a great album. Is it a horrendous album? It is, is it a pile of 
brown smelly stuff um, yeah that's a bit harsh but first of all I have a yeah I have a weakness for um, for uh, bands in crisis and uh, in, uh, interesting albums that came out of such situations and uh, um, I mean certainly Certainly one of my favorite The Who albums would be their last album, It's Hard, because it's a wonderful album. Strangely. I mean it's an it's an it's an it's an odd it's an oddball album, but I really like it and there are some very, very good tracks on it. At the same time, um, yeah people do not talk well about it. So what do I think about Love Beach? Well well I don't particularly like it, but awkwardly enough I'm pretty sure I listen to it like once every year which on a scale of 20-30 years it means that I listen to it quite a lot and um, I I don't know I mean it's I just can take this with a certain smile it's there is a touch of parody in it I don't know if intentional or not but um, yeah, that's three guys that just don't want to do it anymore and they just go to Barbados or where they were and uh, just give Armit Ertegun his final albums just just so he can leave them <laughs> just so he will leave them alone so um about the music how is the music I mean yeah I, of course the A-side is heavily uh, driven by Greg Lake and it's sort of a love song oriented music but some of these tracks are really cool I like the title track, the Love Beach track is actually... Um, I mean if this was some weird album done by some unknown people and uh, it would not be a successful album but it would be sort of an odd oddity where you say like yeah that's interesting that's interesting this is what these guys have done here this strange pop songs I mean not really main main street um, because I mean this the, these three guys were never able to make a real pop song I mean pop songs are done by different people this is not the kind of band those are not the kind of musicians that enter the world of music with this versatile uh, range of possibilities those are not studio musicians so uh, even if they try to sound like a pop band it kind of <laughs> sounds like an odd pop band um, so um, so I find it interesting somehow does it make any sense to you that I don't hate this album so uh, I don't think it's a great album um, I certainly like it a little more than for example Abba Cup by Genesis so um, I don't think this is a horrendous album I think it has uh, interesting songs. It's amusing in a sense because you understand the context. You understand, and those are these three uh, supergroup giants <laughs> that just just record this album somewhere in the Caribbean and basically get drunk the rest of the day <laughs> just not to think about it. Uh, there is something appealing about it. Uh, I don't know if I succeeded in explaining uh, my uh, my uh, perversion um, regarding this album but um, I tried so this was 1978's Love Beach by Emerson, Lake and Palmer and that's all for now I don't know how you look at this I mean I mean if you are one of those that really really hate these albums then it's all right you can't really uh, fight over taste but um, maybe it was my intention to let someone know that uh, those this music is not only hated that uh, I can pick some parts of it that I find quite intriguing or interesting or amusing or just interesting in the way they sound it's just it's all recorded by these uh, these overblown super giants of these 70s uh, bombastic stadium rock and therefore there is this epic expectation expectation combined with disappointment if you rid yourself of this kind of perception you can like a lot of the music on these albums so that was uh, my story about it.
So, have a good day and see you next time.